2 Corinthians chapter 3, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stone, he refers here to the Torah as a ministry of death engraved on stone. Paul is admittedly using very bold speech in this passage. And we have spoken previously already about um, how the um, Old Covenant written through Moses was through a mediator and was uh, there was a lot of uh, cursing and condemnation of death in it in in the the Levitical laws and in um, those who do it shall live by it but those who do not do it shall die by it um, so that's the old covenant and we already discussed how there is a new covenant not like the covenant under Moses but written on their hearts and a covenant uh, done by God himself directly and not through a mediator so we've already learned all of that so he's still um, just picking scriptures out where Paul is uh, using great boldness of speech to make his point even clearer. So we'll read a little bit more from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 just to get an idea where Paul is coming from on this one. Okay, we'll start in verse 2. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So this is not written on paper, it's not written on stone, it's written on hearts of men. You are God's message. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in the tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart, and such trust we have through Christ to God word. We trust through Christ that God is able to do this. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So we learned before about the, um, the law of sin and death. If you sin, you shall die. And the law of life is, if you believe, you shall live. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven on stones, was glorious and it certainly was, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Was to be done away, meaning when in Jeremiah, when God said, I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant that I made under Moses. So, He's bringing in a new covenant, which makes the covenant under Moses old. Which glory was to be done away? How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation is glory, how much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excels. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. So it's like there's parts of the uh, 
Torah that remains, the good parts, the law remains, the, the, uh, the, the, the definition of righteousness remains, but the condemnation of death does not remain, not to Christians. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So he's using great plainness of speech. He's not holding anything back here. So he seems to be condemning the Torah, but he isn't. He's saying how much better the new covenant is than the old. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. So Moses put a veil over his face because the children of Israel couldn't look at him because his face was shining so brilliantly. And if that covenant which was abolished was that glorious, is what he's saying, okay, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil was done away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's just he's just explaining how the New Covenant, written on the hearts of men, it's far more glorious than the Old Covenant written on stone. Because you're not looking at the light coming from Moses. You're looking at the light coming directly from God. In Hebrews chapter 7, For there is an annulling of the commandments going before because of their weakness and uselessness. For the Torah made nothing perfect. Now, Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 7, this is a, a famous chapter, um, and he's talking about the ministry of Melchizedek. As, remem as we remember in, uh, in the Torah, Abraham, when he came back from rescuing his nephew Lot from the battle, he uh, paid a tenth of the booty to, to the priest of, of Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Okay, so now Paul goes in Hebrews chapter 7, we'll start in verse 1. He begins to, uh, he's, he's talking about this ministry of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, or Shalom, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, abides a priest continually. So now he's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek didn't have a beginning or an end in the Torah. And he wasn't, he has no birth and no death. He just comes there and shows up. It's uh, like, a, like an angel. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brothers, 
though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, he's not a son of Abraham. He received the tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So the Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And Abraham was the one who had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. So he must be greater than Abraham if he blessed Abraham instead of Abraham blessing him. And here men that die receive tithes, like the sons of Levi. They die and they, they are born and they die and they receive tithes. But there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receives tithes, paid tithes to Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So Levi was in the loins of Abraham. So Levi, the entire tribe of Levi, in that way paid tithes to Melchizedek. Okay? So if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the, the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after, your, after the order of Aaron? What's he talking about here? He's talking, he's, he's going to start talking about Psalm 110. I'll just read it from the King James. I don't want to dig out the other Bible right now. Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make you, your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at thy right hand and shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. So this is uh, obviously speaking of the coming righteous ruler who will rule over the nations. And he says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So here the author of Hebrews, which uh, in the book of Hebrews, it doesn't, the, the writer of Hebrews does not name himself, but it sounds like Paul. He, he has the same style. So he's saying, If there were perfection by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? Why didn't he say after the order of Aaron? He said a different priesthood. It's a different priesthood because it's a different covenant. Uh, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity, a change also of the law. It's a different covenant, different priesthood, different law. It's, a, it's all different. For he of whom these things are spoken, pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. He's, Melchizedek is not from any of the twelve tribes. He's from somewhere else. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, Jesus came from Judah, of which the tribe Moses spake nothing concerning a tr priesthood, and yet it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arise another priest. 
who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that's forever. This one person is a priest forever. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and prof unprofitableness thereof. So what is the weakness of the Old Covenant? The weakness is in the people. It's not in God. It's righteous. God was righteous in that, in his side of the whole thing. The people were not righteous, and they broke it. And when did the Old Covenant get broken? When Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and they were down there making a golden calf. He went up to get the, the writing of it, and remember, when he came down the mountain, he smashed the, the Ten Commandments that was written on by the finger of God. That signifies that's when that covenant was broken. But then, in order for God's purpose to be fulfilled, Moses went and wrote a new law on the stone himself and came back and continued with the uh, making of the covenant with the people. But it was already broken. This, was a, this now became not directly from God. For the one with God's, that was written on by God's finger, that was broken, smashed on the mountain. This, new, this, this covenant through Moses, Moses wrote it on the stone. It was a covenant through Moses. For the law made nothing perfect. The law condemns. It didn't make anything perfect. It condemned sin. Okay? But the bringing in of a better hope did make something perfect, by which we draw near unto God. So there's a, a new way to draw near to God, which is a more perfect way even than that than the Levitical priesthood. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a priest, so there was an oath, it was the oath that God said, I swear and I will not repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For those priests were made without an oath, the priests of Levi. They were made with priests without an oath. But this, with an oath, by him that said to him, The Lord swore and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So by much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. He's saying that this, this person, this Messiah, this coming leader, is Jesus, and he is the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, most Jewish uh, Jews or rabbis will say, well, where is Jesus? He didn't come and lead the nations. Where is he? Well, in a way, he set it up. Um, he set up the priesthood um, by offering himself and, and, and overshadowing the Levitical priesthood calling upon the destruction of the temple and replacing the Levitical priesthood. And through Christianity spread out through the nations, and it's the Christian nations right now that are the God's strength in the world. Israel's there too, the nation of Israel, but who's backing them up? America, Canada. Um, this is all part of God's plan, God, God's doing. So the, 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 the new kingdom being brought in where, with the eradication of evil, that is coming at an, another stage. 
But this is the first stage that is preparing the way. Um, that's also in, in the Tanakh. But um, it gets kind of complicated when we start looking at all of that. Okay, so now what else is he saying here? Okay, by, uh, and they truly were many priests. The, the, the Levitical priesthood was many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death because they died. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. It's the same guy forever. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing that he lives forever to make intercession for them. So it's not like, um, you know, through this old priest, uh, you, you uh, receive forgiveness and you did your sacrifice, and then he died. And now you have to go to a new priest. Um, this is the same continual priest forever. For such a high priest became, became us. Such a high priest came to, this is a translation issue. Such a high priest came to us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law makes men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of the oath which was since the law, in the Psalm 110, makes the Son who is consecrated forever. So this is what he's talking about. So, you know, you pick one verse out of there. What did, what verse did he pick? Saying, For there is a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So he says, saying, Paul's saying, Oh, the Torah is weak and unprofitable. First of all, he's not talking about the whole Torah. Paul's teaching the Torah. He's talking about the covenant made under Moses and the, and the Levitical priesthood, which is only a part of the Torah. 